What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Another week of NFL football is in the books. Week two is gone, dead and gone. So we gotta look forward to week three. You gotta make sure you are subscribed to my newsletter on the website, bdgeat.com. Right on the homepage, go down below, put your info in, and I'll shoot you out an email every week when I drop my waiver wire top pickups article. Again, that doesn't come out in video form. That's only blog posts every Tuesday between like 12 and 2 p.m. Eastern time. So subscribe to the channel. I'll shoot you out an email when that drops every Tuesday. Also, every Sunday morning, I do a live stream on YouTube. So make sure if you are subscribed to my channel, you uh, have notifications on. You just got to scroll down on the video a little bit, hit the little bell in the description box or whatever it is and go follow me on Twitter to make sure that you get a notification every time I go live. I'll be answering a bunch of shit star questions. You guys who tuned in early got a little glimpse of my softball game. I turned on my live stream and I was playing center field in my softball game. I literally got a fly ball hit right to me as I was I, as I turned the live stream on. I was pumped up. I made the play, of course. But that's neither here nor there. If you enjoyed the week one video or week two, whatever the last week's video was, I got a lot of positive engagement. Scroll down a little bit. Give this video a thumbs up. If I helped you at all, any sit star questions, or if you enjoyed this video, please remember to give the thumbs up. That's how your boy grows. For this video, we got a lot of good stuff we're getting into, and I have the timestamps listed in the description below if you want to jump around. Feel free to go down below in the description, jump around to any parts that you want to touch on. Again, we're going through key injuries, what that means for the outlook of that team, those players, whatever. Notable wide receiver cornerback matchups, murky running back situations, some must starts for the week, sell high candidates, buy low candidates, cut them like OT Genesis, you need to cut them. Five storylines that I'm most looking forward to in week three, some relaxed candidates, guys that you need to hold on, I'm sure they'll turn it around, streaming defenses of the week, and then of course my locks of the century, along with my fantasy football league recaps of my personal leagues. We got all that and then more, so stay tuned. Sit back, go grab some beef jerky, go grab some chicken fingers, go grab some tendies, whatever you gotta do, and enjoy the show. So this was not a good week for tight ends, especially the top tier of tight ends. We saw Gronk, Reed, Olsen, Eifert, Graham all get injured or are on the injury list this week. We'll start off with Gronk, right? Number one tight end. He suffered a minor groin injury in their week two game. It's not supposed to be serious at all. He's already practicing on Wednesday, so he is day-to-day. -day. The fact that he got onto the field on Wednesday means he'll almost definitely be suiting up for their game uh, in week three against Houston. Doesn't seem like a long-term concern. I would say I'm, I'm surprised, or it wouldn't surprise me if they actually sat Gronk for this game. They are two touchdown favorites. They're going against the Texans. I can't imagine any way that they lose this game, so maybe Bill plays it safe, you know, doesn't want to push that groin. But, you know, him suiting up does bode well for his chances of playing. Next guy up would be Dwayne Allen, obviously a tight end on that team who they signed this offseason. Allen doesn't have a catch yet in 2017, so he's not really involved in this offense. And Houston is really, 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 really good at guarding tight ends, especially for fantasy purposes. I, read, I saw a stat somewhere, I don't know if I heard it on a podcast, that like over the last three seasons, Houston's given up 11 or like 13 touchdowns to tight ends over the last three seasons. So they're very hard to come by. Dwayne Allen, even if Gronk is out, Allen's not a great start in his place. I would say the biggest boosts if Gronk were to sit would be James White, Chris Hogan, and Brandon Cooks, and Amendola, who's going to be back this, this week. He's already practicing, so that's also a good sign for Amendola owners. Next up, we got Jordan Reed out in Washington. Now, this situation scares me, right? Not only is Reed dealing with this fractured toe, supposedly, now they're calling him day-to-day -day with a bruised chest. But I heard on a podcast with a doctor, that means it's official, they're talking about he's got a sprained SC joint, not to be confused with Sports Center SC, not to be confused with AC joint that he sprained last year, which Cost him a lot of games, cost him a lot of snaps, and when he was playing, he was very limited. This SC joint, as told by this doctor, says it's actually more painful than the AC joint that he suffered last season. Their head coach, Jay Gruden, basically came out today and, and just straight up was like, Jordan Reed is not healthy. Now, Jordan Reed, after exiting last week's game, did return back to the game, which usually points to them suiting up or them being able to suit up for the next week, right? They're going to be probably very limited if not practicing at all throughout the week, but we'll be able to push it considering they, they did get back into the game. Vernon Davis is the next tight end in Washington. He's not like a guarantee to be a TE1 uh, while Reed is out, if he is out. 
I went back to last season, right? And I looked at the games that Jordan Reed played in 50% of Washington's snaps or less than 50% of their team snaps on offense. And that came out to eight games. So those are either games that he missed completely where he played zero snaps or he was like very limited, right? Due to the injury. That's That would be the only reason he plays in less than 50% of the snaps. There's eight games. Vernon Davis averaged just 3.25 catches and 41 receiving yards and scored one time in those eight games. So I'm not super high on Vernon Davis. I will say they do have a great matchup against the Oakland Raiders who have been okay this year against tight ends, but they were awful in 20. 16. Uh, they're playing at home, the Redskins. Sunday Night Football, they have the highest over-under of any game in Week 3. It's a 54-point over-under. If Jordan Reed plays, he's probably a tight end one. If he doesn't play, Vernon Davis will sneak into that 10 to 15 ranking for tight ends just based on the matchup. Next, we have Greg Olson. Now, obviously, he he hasn't missed a game since his rookie year in 2007. So this this one sucks for, for G-Rig. But he was placed on the IR, right? He fractured his foot broke his foot or whatever he's dealing with a jones fracture now a lot of people like to hype that injury up and say you know this is what jimmy graham this is what julio or not jimmy graham this is what julio jones this is what kevin durant this is what blah 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 went through i'm like yeah but like kevin durant came back and was the MVP, and Julio Jones is a fucking animal, so it's not exactly a fantastic argument. I would say if he tries to come back this year, maybe that, would, uh, that wouldn't that would be such a great look for Olsen. He's out for at least the next eight weeks. That's what IR means. He can return after that, and I believe that's like what the reports are saying, that Carolina expects him back this season. But if you don't have an IR spot, you are dropping Olsen. Maybe if you're in like a 14 or a 16 team league, I would think about stashing him, but you know, roster spots are valuable nowadays, man. You can't be selling them for pennies on the dime. So I'm probably getting rid of Olsen. Ed Dixon would be the next tight end up in Carolina, although he's not really a pretty play. I would say it's an uptick in targets for Kelvin Benjamin for sure, Devin Funchess, probably Christian McCaffrey as well, uh, but ultimately it's probably a downgrade for this offense overall. So I don't see it like really taking a toll on anyone's offense besides Kelvin Benjamin, who I, who I think will get a nice uptick in targets with Olsen's injury. Just keep going down the tight end list. We got Tyler Eifert. Played in 89% of the since he snaps in week one, only 78% in week two, and he looked healthy in their week two game. He looked pretty good. He caught, I think, three balls for 42 yards. Should have had a touchdown in the end zone, but he, he went out of bounds, came back in, didn't reestablish himself. He would have had a good week two game, fantasy-wise, if it weren't for that dumb mistake he had. But now, reports are coming out saying he's dealing with both back and knee injuries. Probably like the two things you didn't want to hear if you're an Eifert owner in fantasy, back and knee, when you associate it with him. So there's a very, very strong possibility he gets held out of week three's game. Now, I'm not, I'm not on the bandwagon where I want to drop Eifert. He's someone I'm going to wait and hold on because they just fired their OC and they have Bill Lazor coming in, Lazor, whatever, however you say it, as their new offensive coordinator. He's going to be a Chip Kelly incumbent. He learned a lot from Chip Kelly and I, I I think that this offense is gonna progress and it's gonna be it's gonna take a turn to be a little different than it has been over the previous week. So before I drop any or worry about any Cincinnati Bengals players, that means Eifert, Mixon, AJ Green, even Dalton, John Ross, I wanna see over the next few weeks what the new OC, you know, means to this offense. Eifert didn't practice on Wednesday, and if I had to put money on it right now, I would say Eifert probably doesn't play. If he does play, he still gets a Packers D that shut down Jimmy Graham week one, shut down Austin Hooper week two. If Pfeiffer doesn't play, I actually feel like this might be a downgrade to A.J. Green as well because the defense really only has to focus on him as the primary we weapon in this in this offense. There's no one I'm really it's psyched about adding on, on this offense if Tyler Eifert's injury is more serious than than we know about right now. Lastly, we have Jimmy Graham out in Seattle. Head coach Pete Carroll says Graham is dealing with an ankle injury. Reports are also, also saying it's a knee issue. It's questionable for week three. He didn't practice on Wednesday, but I'm not, that's not like a dead end because think back to last year when he's coming back from that patellar tendon injury, Graham like didn't even practice throughout the year. He hasn't done anything this season though that, you know, that, that would make you want to start him even if he does play. He has like 10 yards receiving this O-line is it's like Swiss cheese O-line over here, the way they're letting guys through the fucking holes. Graham is going to be asked to block a lot while he's in the games. Even if Graham suits up, it's not someone that I'm looking to start in week three. It's definitely someone you're going to need to look for alternatives for. So I put together a little piece here that, you know, could be your best tight end alternatives. If you happen to have one of these guys, luckily I got Travis Kelsey in my big league. He's like one of six guys who avoided the injury bug. What a bug. So last week, my tight end play of the week, my must start was Eric Ebron going against against that G-Men or that Tutty. He got you them points if you started him, if you listened. Now, Zach Ertz is not going to be on the waiver wire, and I'll talk about him more in my must-starts, but get him in your lineup. We'll put it that way. I would say the best alternatives for week three options at tight end, 
Now, Jack Doyle's owned in most leagues, but he might be available in your league. I would go check. He gets uh, Cleveland, who led up a 642 touchdown stat line to Jesse James in week one. Eight catches, 91 yards to Benjamin Watson in week two. Doyle's coming off a really strong eight for 79 game in week two as well. So he should take advantage of that Cleveland matchup. You have Austin Hooper this week at Detroit. Now, Darius Slay will look to probably shadow and try to lock down Julio Jones. So the Falcons might have to look elsewhere for receiving production. Detroit did just let up a combined five catches for 87 yards and a touchdown to Giants tight ends. The over-under in this Atlanta-Detroit game is 50 and a half, which is the second highest of week three. So you could definitely do worse than Austin Hooper, who's probably available in a lot of leagues here. High scoring game, not a great tight end fantasy defense in Detroit. So, and speaking of New York Giants tight ends, we have Evan Ingram. Looked really good in week two. Not a bad play here at Philadelphia. They have a good defense, Philadelphia, for sure. But they did just get torched by Travis Kelsey. And, you know, Ingram is kind of a similar player to Kelsey in terms of his athleticism and what he brings as a, as a pass catcher in that position. So I don't love Ingram, but you could do worse. Next up, we got Jared Cook. Oakland, you know, they're playing playing, like I said, in this week's highest over-under total of 54 and a half. Sunday Night Football, Washington let up 95 receiving yards to Ertz in week one, 93 receiving yards to Gerald Everett in week two. So we got bite to bite tight end performances that would make you more than happy if you're just streaming someone. So I like Jared Cook here to have, you know, like a five catch minimum, probably somewhere between 50, 75, 80 yards in that in that range. So PPR play, I really like Cook here. And Zach Miller is someone who I've had on my waiver wire sheet each of the last two weeks. I think his floor is basically four to five catches in this offense. They're going to be trailing. They're playing against Pittsburgh, who we know can, can score plenty of points. Chicago doesn't score a lot of points, so they're going to have to throw the ball a lot. They're going to be playing catch-up, as we've seen, and Zach Miller's put up four or five catches each of the last two weeks. Something I can, I think we'll continue seeing, right? Him and Cohen be the center of this passing offense, if you even want to call that what they have there in Chicago. All right, so that wraps up tight end injuries. There's a plenty of other injuries to go through. Uh, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, both left Nelson with a quad injury, Cobb with a shoulder injury. Neither of them are serious, both day-to-day. If one or both of them sits, Geronimo Allison is the next wide receiver up. He played 80% of their snaps in week two. So if you're looking for a deep flyer, if one of these guys sits, I expect both of them to play. But again, they're nine point favorites. So it's possible maybe they sit whichever one of them is more banged up. Just someone to keep an eye on. We have Corey Coleman broke his hand again for the second time. Placed on the IR, missed the next eight weeks. Kenny Britt faded, you know, one catch for two yards and faded. Sounds like my Saturday night. One catch for two yards. Rashard Higgins out snapped him, out produced him. He's my favorite Cleveland wide receiver going forward. I also wrote about that in my waiver wire sheet. He's my second favorite wide receiver pickup this week behind JJ Nelson. If you have an IR spot, throw Coleman in there. If you don't, I'm not keeping him in anything less shallow than a 14 team league. We have Rob Kelly, who is believed to have fractured his rib. It looks like it's a lot less serious than that. He's just dealing with some bruised ribs, some something with the cartilage. I don't really want to get into it. It is what it is, what it is. Either way, he looked good before he left their week two game against the Rams. It was like 12 carries, 78 yards. He went down. P. Ryan had 21 carries for 67 yards. Did not look good. That is not good yards per carry numbers for y'all that are slow in the mathematics department. We had Chris Thompson absolutely explode, which is going to have some recency bias to it because Thompson's workload is not changing regardless of who's in there on the early down carries and for the rushing short yardage, goal line, that kind of thing. So Chris Thompson is a nice PPR floor, right? He'll give you four to five catches a week, but he's not going to suddenly get 10 to 15 carries. Jay Gruden literally came out and was like, he's too small for us to depend on him with a big workload. So Thompson is a guy that I'm not breaking the budget on. Same thing with Pirine. I don't love either of these guys. Rob Kelly's probably going to play. He got in a limited practice on Wednesday. So it's just a messy, messy, messy backfield altogether. Thompson is the PPR play here. Again, over under 54 and a half. It should be a shootout. He should get five, six catches. Kelly and Pirine will probably split the work. If Kelly sits, I would say Pirine and Thompson Thompson are both flex considerations, nothing more than that. And, you know, you got to be realistic here. Thompson has just six carries through their first two games, seven catches. So while he's been ridiculously efficient, he scored like two or three touchdowns on the year, two touchdowns last week, a touchdown in the week one. That's not going to be, it's not going to be happening every week. You don't expect him to score 16, 18 touchdowns, right? So you're not getting a lot of volume with Thompson and scoring opportunities are not always going to be there. So you have to be realistic with him. He is a volatile boomer bust kind of play. Move to Jordan Howard. Uh, again, outtouched and and outproduced by rookie Tariq Cohen. Uh, Howard is trending downhill fast. I would 
sell the shit out of him if you could for anything close to his draft capital. He was spotted after the game in a sling, which was to do with the shoulder uh, shoulder injury that we already knew he was kind of dealing with. If he plays against Pittsburgh, you know, he's nothing more than a low-end RB2. I'd almost consider him an RB3, and that's like in standard leagues. They're going to trail, like usual. He sucks at catching. Cohen is amazing at catching. Simple as that. Right now, Cohen is easily the own to have there in that backfield in PPR leagues, and uh, Howard is just spiraling downhill quick. Then we have a couple Tennessee Titans. DeMarco Murray, Corey Davis dealing with his hamstring injury. Both of them are considered day-to-day, -day, so we'll just have to kind of wait on that. We saw Derrick Henry bust out, and everyone's like, oh shit, it's the changing of the guards, right? He, he ran for two touchdowns. He looked like an absolute animal. He looked better in this second half of this game than at any point DeMarco has during this year, right? It turns out he wasn't benched, though. It was just the tight hamstring he was dealing with. Either way, you can't ignore it, how good Henry looked. It's looking like it's going to turn into a split backfield, but it, it remains that the coaching staff trusts Murray as a pass blocker, as their pass catching back, so he's not going to lose third down work. He's still going to have some of the early down work. He's still going to have some of the goal line work, so he's definitely a hold for me until the situation shakes out. Murray still out-snapped Henry 37-30 to 30 in week two, despite not even playing in the second half, so he's probably less than 100% going into week three, but they do have a matchup against Seattle, so I'm probably just staying away from this backfield altogether for week three. Davis, I'm a little more concerned about because he missed all of preseason with the hamstring injury, right? I'm hoping, honestly, that they give him a week or two off just to recover because he has tough passing matchups against Seattle and against Houston next week. So I, I would kind of expect like shitty games against, against those defenses to begin with. So they let him sit out and then come back week five where he gets Miami, Indianapolis, Cleveland on three game slate. So I really like Corey Davis as a hold and even like a buy low candidate over the next few weeks. Lastly, we have Bradford who randomly, you know, was was inactive for week two with his knee injury. It's a bit concerning to be honest, but it's, you know, they said he's dealing with a bone bruise and reports have him day to day, likely is going to play in week three hopefully for Stefan Diggs, Adam Thielen, and the rest of his offense, Kyle Rudolph, Dalvin Cook, that that is the case because Case Keenum is just not getting the job done. He averaged 4.5 yards per attempt in week two. If Bradford plays, I'm happy starting all the Vikings that I normally would start. If not, Thielen is probably the only guy I would consider as like a flex play here, but nothing more than like a low wide receiver three because Keenum just can't really move that offense and operate that offense. Lastly, we have John Brown. I, I'll talk about it later, but I think it's safe to drop John Brown, honestly. He's basically like Andrew Luck. We like really don't know what's going on here. We have no idea if he's going to be back, when he's going to be back, how effective he'll be. If I had to put my money on it, I would say Brown probably misses like six games this season. And in the games that he is playing, he might be limited. So, you know, JJ Nelson was my top waiver wire pickup at the wide receiver position this week. We just don't know about John Brown and when or if when he's going to be back. And as for Andrew Luck, it doesn't look like he's anywhere close to returning. He's still not even practicing and throwing and shit. So I heard an interesting theory, though, actually, that uh, the only reason they took him off off the pup list was to keep like their fans engaged, right? Because they thought like, oh, we're going to have hope for this season. Andrew Luck's going to be back in the first like two, three weeks. We're all happy about it. We'll sell tickets. We'll get people in the stadium. And it like, it honestly seems like that might be a realistic theory because if you're a Colts fan, you know, I'd show up to those first couple games knowing that we're getting Andrew Luck back. Now it doesn't look like we have any time frame on his return. So John Brown, Andrew Luck, I'm totally okay dropping. Next up, I'll get into the notable wide receiver cornerback matchups. But again, like last week, that sheet doesn't drop on Pro Football Focus until tomorrow. I'm filming this Wednesday night. That comes out Thursday. So I will film that part, edit it up, put it into the video. Boom, it's Thursday. A few things to say real quick. If you're enjoying the video so far, make sure you scroll down, give it the thumbs up. All these, uh, when I do the notes for my videos, I write them up in blog form also. So these are also available. Like all the notes I do for my YouTube videos, including the weekly recaps are available on the site. So you can check out my blog later if you want to kind of read about the things that I, uh, I talk about in here. It's also in the blog form. So check that out if you want to support your boy. You can check out the store while you're on the blog. We got t-shirts, crew neck sweatshirts, dad hats, you always see me rocking. Go support your boy, go support the brand. Big dogs gotta eat. Let's get into wide receiver cornerback matchups. I like this a lot because this is breakdowns that not a lot of people get into or not a lot of depth is done on this on a weekly basis when you're talking about fantasy analysis. And most of these numbers, almost all the numbers are broken down straight from pro football focus. So I'm signed up for like a subscription with PFF Elite or Edge, whatever it is. Um, so this is something I pay for and then I deliver it to you guys via them. So all the credit to pro football focus for this stuff. So we'll start off with the first matchup I see. Keenan Allen versus Philip Gaines. We got the Chargers playing at home against Kansas City. Now, Adam Leviton tweeted this out yesterday. He mentioned that Keenan Allen only lined up on the right side of the field on 12% of his snaps this season. So he'll basically be avoiding Marcus Peters 
for all of week three. Maybe 10% of his routes will go against Marcus Peters. 63% of Keenan Allen's routes have been from the slot. You look at KC, Philip Gaines is strictly a slot receiver, a uh, slot defender. So he'll run all of his routes from the slot, defending Keenan Allen for a large portion of the game. Now, Gaines is dead last. According to Pro Football Focus, his ranking through two weeks as a cornerback is dead last among 96 qualified cornerbacks. All these rankings, ratings, and stuff like that, all out of 96 cornerbacks. Philip Gaines dead last. He's giving up the second most fantasy points per route run of any slot cornerback in the NFL. So Keenan Allen should have a monster day, monster PPR day there. Next up, I want to talk about Alan Hearns, someone I was high on last week. I'm going to be high on again this week. They're playing in London against Baltimore, but do not let that matchup scare you. Listen, say what you want about garbage time. It's going to be a constant piece of their game. And Alan Hearns got it done for fantasy owners last week, right? Around 70 to 80 receiving yards, five, six catches, and he scored a touchdown. Now he goes against Ladarius Webb. That's going to be his primary defender because, again, Alan Hearns runs most of his routes from the slot. He's ran 74% of his routes from the slot so far this season. Ladarius Webb is solely a slot cornerback. He doesn't move outside at all. Now, a lot of people have this idea that the Baltimore pass defense is crazy good, and they are good, but they've They've won against Cleveland, and they went against Cincinnati. So not great teams, but their strength is on the outside, where they have Brandon Carr and Jimmy Smith as, as the cornerbacks on the outside, right? But Darius Webb, however, is the ninth worst ranked cornerback, according to PFF this year, through two games. And he's letting up the single most points per route run against him. He's letting up .53 fantasy points per route run against him. Every time your slot receiver, every time Alan Hearns goes up against the Darius Webb, he's getting half a fantasy point against him. And he's had, it's not a small sample size. He had 62 routes run against him. So he's given up more than 30 fantasy points over the first two weeks. You look at Rashard Higgins last week on Cleveland, tore him up 95 yards, seven catches. So Alan Hearns, the slot receivers going against Baltimore is not something to be afraid of. Next up, we got Mike Evans, Tampa Bay going to Minnesota and he will be shadowed by Xavier Rhodes. I'm sure by now you've heard how good Xavier Rhodes has been. This is going to be one of Evans' toughest matchups of the season. Rhodes is strictly a shadow cornerback and through two games, he's had to cover Michael Thomas and Antonio Brown, so he's had his mix of size, speed, athleticism, all that kind of stuff, right? Plenty of experience. You go back to 2016, dating back to 2016, Xavier Rose has held Antonio Brown, OBJ, and Michael Thomas to eight catches for a combined 73 yards, zero touchdowns. And you look at the first two matchups of this year, Xavier Rhodes, right? While Rhodes was guarding Michael Thomas and Antonio Brown, they combined for five catches and 50 yards against him. He's a legit shutdown corner. He's like one of the only, he, he's big too, right? Evans is 6'5", but Xavier Rhodes, where he, you know, Evans usually has a huge advantage over cornerbacks, not no pun intended, just due to the fact that he is so much bigger than them, right? Xavier Rhodes holds his own, though. He's around, like, 6'2". He's got a ton of muscle on his frame, right? He's ripped up. He's, like, 220 pounds. And he can run with guys like Antonio Brown. So he'll have no problem staying with a guy like Mike Evans. And he has the size to match up against him. So I'm not saying, you know, take Evans out of your lineup or anything. But I would be surprised if he put up wide receiver one numbers this year. So maybe that's more of, like, a DFS thing for you guys. Moving down the list, we have Terrell Pryor going against David Amerson in Oakland. Again, Sunday. Monday Night Football, the highest over under of the week, 54 points. Jordan Reed is banged up. We don't even know if he's going to play. Terrell Pryor has had by far the most snaps for any Redskins wide receiver. So he's getting on the field more than any receiver. He should be getting most of the targets for the wide receivers, which he has. And the targets will eventually flow into him. He had a really tough matchup last week with Tremaine Johnson, who's one of PFF's highest rated cornerbacks at this time through two weeks. It gets much easier with David Amerson, who is the 81st ranked cornerback from Pro Football Focus among 96 qualified cornerbacks. So Getting a much easier matchup this week. Again, Jordan Reed might be out. Kirk Cousins has averaged over 300 passing yards in his primetime games. He's had eight primetime games throughout his career, 307 passing yards to be exact. Last year, he averaged 340 passing yards in the primetime games. So look for Kirk to light up the scoreboard. This high over under, it should be a shootout. Throw prior should get anywhere from seven to eight catches in this game. Hopefully he finds the end zone. I think this is a week that Washington could really turn shit around. But I also don't understand why the NFL keeps feeding up. Like they think the rest of the country cares so much about NFC East matchups. Like stop putting them as the Showtime games. Whatever. Next up, JJ Nelson playing at home against Dallas. He'll get a blend of Nolan Carroll and Chidobe Owuzi. I definitely didn't say that right, but Orlando Skandrick missed week two for Dallas with a broken hand. So Dallas is digging into the depth chart and I don't think Skandrick is going to play this week. In my waiver wire piece, you know, I wrote about JJ Nelson and how he fits with Carson Palmer, They're like lamb and tuna fish over there. His speed matched up with Palmer chucking it deep. He was my favorite waiver wire pickup for this week. You have John Brown out for week three. Nelson will start at wide receiver, lined up across from Nolan Carroll or 
Chidobe Awuzie. Now, Chidobe Awuzie is a rookie, so Nelson will be able to either pick on a rookie or Carroll, who is PFF's 94th ranked cornerback. Again, this is out of 96, so Carroll's been awful this year. So I'm looking for Nelson to break off a few big plays on Monday Night Football. There's a healthy over-under of 47. Dallas, you know, got eaten up by Emmanuel Sanders in week two, so I'm expecting another five catches, maybe 70 to 90 yards, and I'd say like 60% chance that J.J. Nelson breaks a big play and gets into the end zone. My last wide receiver I want to pin down on is Demarius Thomas. He's basically been what I expected him to be coming into the year, which is like a decent wide receiver two in PPR leagues only, wide receiver high end, wide receiver three in that range. Getting a lot of targets, getting a decent amount of catches, but he's not finding the end zone. I think things kind of switch in week three when they go against Buffalo. They're in Buffalo. He'll get a nice matchup against EJ Gaines. Now him and Sanders shift on the field a lot, right? They both take snaps from the left side. They both take snaps from the right side. Trevor Simeon's looked really good through the first two games and Gaines, EJ Gaines has, has done exactly the opposite of that. He's the sixth worst cornerback rated by PFF through the first two weeks. He stays on the right side for the most part. D. Thomas runs about 42% of his snaps on the left side, so he'll get a lot of gains. He runs 5% more of his snaps on the left side than Sanders does, so they'll both see like a decent amount of uh, EJ gains. You also gotta keep in mind, while people are kinda like touting this Bills defense as like an underrated pass D, they went against the Jets in week one, then they went against the Panthers last week, which Cam Newton easily should have had another two passing scores, if not more, right? He overthrew Christian McCaffrey on a wide open touchdown. Uh, Calvin Benjamin should have came down with a ball. So a few things break in the Panthers' favor in that last game, and you're not you're not so scared of this Buffalo defense at all. So I like DT to have a nice game, especially PPR, and I think he finds the end zone as well. Now these two teams, I'm talking about Baltimore and Tennessee. Just overall, I'm not playing any wide receivers that are in either of these two teams. No one on Baltimore is good enough to go against the cornerbacks in Jacksonville between Ramsey, Boy, and Colvin. I would have considered considered throwing Rashard Matthews in my lineup had Corey Davis been suiting up, but Corey Davis is sitting. It's, you know, it's a fact now. It's been decided. And Rashard Matthews is going to see a lot of Richard Sherman. I, I can't start Rashard Matthews against Sherman. It's just too tough of a matchup. I don't know if Mariota is good enough to be able to produce enough for fantasy wide receivers there. And I definitely just don't trust Decker enough to get him in my lineup. And for what it's worth, Pro Football Focus has Rashard Matthews rated as the 14th best wide receiver through two games so far. 14th best in the NFL, easily the best on the Titans roster so far. So Shard, maybe the numbers aren't there yet, but he is performing as a very, very, very good NFL receiver for the Titans. Those are like my individual matchups. I do want to just get into really quickly other wide receivers that are expected to be shadowed this week. You have Alshon Jeffrey going against Janoris Jenkins of the Giants. Jenkins is the number eight ranked cornerback. Tyreek Hill going against Casey Hayward of the Chargers. He's the number six ranked cornerback. Julio Jones is going to get shadowed by Darius Slay in Detroit, number 12 ranked cornerback. Des Bryant, again, will get shadowed by Patrick Peterson, who is the fourth. 14th ranked cornerback for PFF. Devontae Parker, another shadow matchup versus Maurice Claiborne on the Jets. Claiborne is surprisingly putting up a top 20 cornerback year as per PFF ratings. So it's a tough matchup for Parker again after getting Hayward last week. And last we have Kelvin Benjamin, who I'll talk about later again, going against Marshawn Lattimore of the Saints. And Lattimore has been terrible. He is the number 75 ranked cornerback. So look for Kelvin Benjamin to have a big, 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 big game. And back to Wednesday. First up, we got Seattle. Not really murky anymore. Chris Carson dominated touches, dominated snaps. We had Thomas Rolls finally come back and play. You know, he was eased into the game, but Carson just looked great, right? He looked like he was shot out of a cannon on some of his runs. He saw 50 snaps. Procise only saw 17, Rawls 16. Carson carried the ball 20 times. That is RB1 type workload. They had him in on their important drives, their closeout drives, pass blocking. He caught a pass. Now I do, I want to say I'm not sure I'm ready to drop Rawls unless you really need the spot. Because I want to see how this workload works itself out once Rawls is actually fully healthy. Are they going to give him 8 to 10, 12 carries a game and ha also have Carson, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 carries a game? Or is Carson actually running away with the job. To me, it seems like, you know, Carson is definitely, I'm de that's just more me on the cautious side, but it, Carson is easily the one to own here. He's easily the RB1 in Seattle. I was looking at some numbers today, just basic numbers. Among running backs with more than 20 carries on the year, Carson is fourth in yards per carry, tied for third in average yards after contact per carry, and second in tackles eluded per carry, behind only Kareem Hunt in that last stat. So he's the real deal, and he's doing it behind arguably one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL, if not the worst. So, so 
salute to Chris Carson. I own him on all four of my teams. Oh, actually three now because I traded Carson and Carson and someone else for Melvin Gordon. So I own him in three of my four other leagues. So I'm happy about that. Then we move to Cincinnati again. I feel like they're going to keep finding their way onto this into this section for me. We had Mixon again, either lead or tie the team in running back touches. Geo's dominating in snaps though. On the year, Geo has 62 snaps. Mixon 38. Jeremy Hill 25. Mixon is still very much a hold and a buy low guy for me. And I love again that the fact that this new offensive coordinator, Bill Lazier, is coming in. And I really think he's going to change things up. I think he's going to spark something. He's going to try to light a fire under this offense. And that would definitely be one way to do it by getting Mixon, who everyone is so hyped up about, into the game more, getting more touches, getting more snaps. For now, you can't trust anyone in the backfield. Like you're not starting Geo. You're not starting Mixon. You're definitely not starting. You shouldn't own Hill at this point, but it's no one you could trust there really. Like I said before, Lazier is, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm just going to say Lazier for the rest of the, uh, you know, Lazier is, you know, a Chip Kelly disciple. Like I said before, if he uses what he's learned, if he takes that type of offense and puts it here in Cincinnati, I think it'll work really well for them because you look at their weak points, right? It's their offensive line. And what you want to do in a Chip Kelly offense is get the quarterback kind of moving outside of the pocket. You want to get things up tempo, really quick paced, and that'll work well for this offensive line because Dalton is just athletic enough that he can scramble fine in the backfield, right? Kind of roll out, bootleg a little bit, get those short passes going, and I think that that works well for guys like Geo and and Joe Mixon here. So that's good because their offensive line has just been so bad. I was looking at uh, NFL Next Gen stats. Andy Dalton has averaged 2.59 seconds in the pocket to throw per play. Think about it. 2.59 seconds. Seconds. Imagine getting the ball snap. One, two, got to get it out or you're about to get smacked by some big ass defender. So that's that. Again, can't play anyone there, but move on to the Jets. I'm sorry. I'll hold a huge L here on Blau Powell. If I told you to start him or if you kept him and you started him because of me or whatever. Say, I just apologize, all right? It happened. I don't know what the New York Jets are doing. I don't know what they're doing in their backfield. They're not in win mode. They're not in tank mode. They're in like, I don't give a single fuck mode right now about anything. I don't know what, what's going on here, right? We had Forte took the reins back over in week two. He outsnapped Powell 27 to 18. Even the rookie Elijah McGuire got 11 snaps here. Forte got nine carries compared to the other two. Six is carries a piece. Looked actually pretty good. 53 yards, 5.9 yards per carry on those limited nine attempts. He also caught all four of his targets for 38 yards. McGuire caught one of his two targets for seven yards. Powell didn't catch a single ball. So I guess it's safe to drop Blau Powell. Don't look at McGuire in like redraft leagues. He's not, he has no value. Um, they barely have enough value for any running back, let alone multiple. It's just an ugly situation. They don't have a single back that's had a goal line rush yet. They're not scoring touchdowns there. So drop Powell. I wouldn't even care if you drop Forte, but move along. We go to the Houston Texans. Uh-oh, Lamar Miller owners. Uh-oh, we saw him get a lot of touches in week two, right? Another 21 touch outing for him, but rookie Deonta Foreman looked good. He got his opportunity finally. You know, Bill O'Brien said he's going to play more. He's going to get more involved. And he absolutely, he did that, right? He got 12 carries. He only rushed for 40 yards, but he looked good in doing so. And an offense like this badly needs a spark. So you put a guy, Foreman's built just like Leonard Fournette is, right? Maybe he's got a little bit more uh, body fat on him, but he's big, he's strong, and he's actually pretty fast. So... That's a guy that you can definitely see eating more and more into the workload here. So Miller is definitely no longer an RB1. His reduction has been mediocre. I mean, they have a bad offensive line, just a bad overall offense. So you're not seeing a lot of scoring opportunities to begin with. So I'm not getting like super high on one or the other running back unless there's an injury to one of them. So I would sell Lamar Miller now if I could. I'm not selling him for like 10 cents on the dollar. What I would say is though, it might be worthwhile waiting on Miller because they have this game against New England in week three, and they're like heavy, heavy underdogs. They're two touchdown underdogs, basically. And Miller is definitely the preferred pass catching back there. So it wouldn't surprise me to see him walk away with like four to six catches in this game and put up like a really nice PPR fantasy day. And then maybe you can capitalize on selling him high after this game. But Deonta Foreman needs to be owned everywhere. Two more shitty backfields. The Cardinals and the Eagles. They're basically, outside of Darren Sproles on Philly, they are just backfields to completely avoid. Kerwin Williams like got the start, right? People were excited about him. Eventually gave way to Chris Johnson, who led the team in rushes with 11 carries. And Philly, LeGarrette Blunt and Wendell Smallwood were like literally not even used in this game whatsoever. Wentz has attempted 85 pass attempts through their first two games. So it looks like they're gonna, again, be one of the, like, the pass heaviest offenses in the NFL, right? They were like number six in pass attempts in 2016. So it's not really a big surprise 
surprise, but there will be games where, like this, where the running backs get literally no play outside of Darren Sproles. He's dominating in snaps. Again, he was on my waiver wire sheet, so Sproles is the running back to own in Philly. I don't even think the other two are rosterable outside of 14 plus team leagues. And then out of both of these backfields, I guess Chris Johnson would be my second favorite. I do expect him to take over early down work eventually. Bruce Arians obviously trusts him. That being said though, Andre Ellington dominates the passing down, so he'll never be like the three full down back. Ellington out snapped the other two, 30 to 18. Kerwin Williams to 17 CJ2K. So they're just backfields you don't really want a piece of. Lastly, we got Baltimore, the Ravens. And I guess I didn't touch on Terrence West during the injury, so this could work. Terrence West is day-to-day, -day, I guess, or questionable for this week, at least with a soft knee tissue injury. It's not supposed to be very serious, but they did bring up Alex Collins last week from the practice squad and then Jeremy Langford today from the practice or this week from the practice squad, Terrence West did not practice on Wednesday, so it's not a great sign for West for his week three game against uh, the Jaguars in London. So it's looking like Buck Allen is the back to own here. You know, he outtouched West for the second straight week, 19 to 10. He's a clear pass catching back, but I will say I'm still a little bit skeptical of Buck Allen as like a really clear cut RB2 with a ton of upside. You know, West played a lot in the first half. He got a lot of his carries in the first half while the game was still intact, and eventually the Ravens took over, you know, and dominated the rounds, but West was still heavily involved. I think if West is out for this week, Buck is definitely like a, a secured RB2 for this game against Jacksonville with, with a bunch of upside. But here's, I mean, don't get me wrong, right? The opportunity is definitely there to be had, but this is what I, I, I see when I look at Allen. I rewatched the game and I wanted to see Allen's carries. I wanted to see, you know, how he looked, if he really looked like he can keep this kind of performance up for the coming weeks. And he carried the ball 14 times for 66 yards, which is great. 4.7 yards per carry, but he had a 37 yard rush at the end of the game, right? It was a big ass hole. He was basically untouched. Had he not been running like like fat Eddie Lacy, he should have scored a touchdown. He got tackled on like the two or three yard line, but it looked like he was moving like he just ate a 17 inch meatball parm. So if you take away that big run where he was untouched, you're looking at 13 carries for 29 yards. That's 2.2 yards per carry. And then he got his receiving touchdown. And then he got his receiving touchdown, which really saved him in a lot of fantasy leagues, right? Uh, but those are touchdowns are kind of few and far between, especially receiving touchdowns. So you can't really rely on them. They also lost their all-pro all caliber left guard, Marshall Yanda. That also might be like a really big hit to their to their ground game. And I'm looking at some of their rushing tendencies for the year so far. Rushing to the left side where, where Yanda played, the Ravens have eight first downs. They had seven to the right. They had four negative rushes to the left and they had six to the right. They had four rushes of 10 plus yards to the left and three to the right. So they are, they do, you know, work both sides of the ball well and the stats are pretty even, but you could expect a dip in and the left side rushing now that Yonda's out. And I know it's, you know, it's it's pulling strings. I'm poking a lot of soft spots here between take away this carry and take away the touchdown, Marshall Yonda. But I'm just saying these are things that I'm a little skeptical of when it comes to Buck Allen. He just didn't jump off the screen to me as like a great running back uh, when I rewatched the game. So let's move over to our must-starts. The must-starts get to the chapter. Get them in your lineup. We look back at last week, right? I had five must-starts listed. It was Ty Montgomery, Gillisley, James White, Bilal Powell, and Eric Ebron. So I hit off four out of five. That ain't bad. Move over to this week. We got Zach Ertz, Philadelphia tight end going against the G-Men. I already kind of covered this in my in the tight end breakdown, but this is a really easy one, right? Ertz has been great this year. He now has eight targets in at least eight targets in both of the first two games. 18 targets on the year, which is second most of all tight ends in the NFL. He had 93 yards in week one, 97 yards in week two, consistently producing. He hasn't scored a touchdown yet, but that's where the G-men come in because that's what they give to tight ends, right? Giants have played awful against tight ends so far this year. They've let up a touchdown to both Jason Witten and Eric Ebron in back-to-back -back week. Both tight ends have caught at least five passes in their matchup with the G-Men. So even if you have Ertz as like a flex play or something, get him in your lineup. Even if you have like a Gronk or a Kelsey as well as Ertz, make sure you get Ertz in the lineup too. Next up, we got the combo out in Carolina, Cam Newton, Kelvin Benjamin. They're going against the New Orleans Saints. And it's pretty much as simple as that. They are playing against the Saints. They're at home. They're six point favorites. You know, the Saints are by far and away the worst pass defense in the NFL. They're allowing 11.2 yards per attempt. The next worst team is the Colts and they're allowing full 1.5 yards less per attempt. They've allowed almost 800 passing yards through the first two games. And they've allowed three passing touchdowns to both Bradford and Tom Brady. 
So I would be shocked if Cam Newton doesn't score at least two touchdowns through the air. I know you have Greg Olson out now. Kelvin should definitely see an uptick in targets. He's already leading the team in targets, so that should only be more of a premise to get Kelvin Benjamin in your lineup. He's a little banged up, but it's nothing serious. He's day to day. He should be fine suiting up in week three. Now I rewatched the game and really I didn't think Cam looked that bad. There's a lot of people saying that he's not back to his full self. I was one of them until I rewatched the game. You know, there were a few bad throws, but I think that happens with any quarterback in, in any given week. But for me, mostly he looked fine. Just that offense as a whole wasn't running that smoothly. I think this is the week that Carolina really puts it together and Cam puts himself back into that like QB1 conversation. And then on a side note, I'm actually debating between I have Cam Newton and Drew Brees in my E-Town Get Down League. So I'm debating who I want to start. And, at, you know, at, at a bird's eye view, it's like, oh, Drew Brees against the Panthers. That's an easy one. I'm actually, I think I'm leaning towards Cam because, you know, Brees is not good away from home. It's not good outside of New Orleans. And the Panthers, this is actually surprising. They have the second best pass D so far in 2017 behind just Denver. Denver is 5.2 yards per attempt. Panthers are 5.3 yards per attempt. And that's like a stat you should look at, not like overall passing yards per game because that all depends on are the is the other team passing the ball a lot, right? Because that's, that's very skewed. That doesn't tell efficiency like yards per attempt does. I know the Panthers went against Brian Hoyer and Tyrod Taylor, so you definitely have to take that with a grain of salt. But, you know, you look at their top two cornerbacks, James Bradbury, Daryl Worley, they're both ranked top 28 cornerbacks according to pro football focus so they have an underrated pass defense and uh you know they have probably the best linebacking trio in thomas davis luke keekley and shaq thompson who should be able to kind of lock down kobe fleener as a tight end as well as the running backs in new orleans who you know drew Brees loves to use in the passing game numero trace i'm gonna get a lot of shit for this one i can already feel it my boy Amir Abdullah. I'll go down with this train, I don't care. And I'll die with Amir Abdullah if I need to. If it means the end of me, so be it. My boy Blue, my boy Abdul. We'll just start off with, you know how bad Atlanta is against pass catching backs, right? They got eaten up against Tariq Cohen. They got eaten up against Ty Montgomery again in week two. And you're saying, should be Theo Riddick, right? He's the pass catching back here. I'm fading the chalk. I'm fading Riddick and I'm going with my boy Amir. You look at what he's done in the first two weeks, nothing crazy, but he's gotten at least 17 touches in both weeks. Atlanta surrenders the fourth most fantasy points to running backs in 2017 so far. Running backs going against Atlanta have combined for four touchdowns, 309 total yards. That's just two games. Four touchdowns in two games for running backs. They'll be without their all pro edge defender, in Vic Beasley. And Atlanta's also 31st in the NFL in yards per carry. They're letting up 5.4 yards per carry to opposing runners. The over-under in this game is 50.5. So they're expecting high scoring. They're expecting a shootout. They're expecting a lot of scoring opportunities. Second highest total for the week behind Washington and the Raiders. If there's ever a place to play Abdullah, this is the week to do it, right? He's coming off career high, 86 rushing yards against a stiff New York Giants run defense. He also had a nice 21 yard catch and run in that game that was called back from a penalty. And I know this is like, I hate when people skew shit like this, but if you were to add that to his receiving stats, he's only like 10 or 12 yards behind theoretic in receiving yards on the year. Take that as you want. I, I like Amir Abdullah to again, get 17 plus probably closer to 20 touches in this game and uh if he breaks a big one he's gonna he's gonna hit pay dirt so we'll move on to number four other tight end talked about my boy jack doyle already he's going against the cleveland browns in week three jesse james scored two touchdowns on him and watson went eight for 91 against cleveland last week jack doyle is coming off that eight for 79 game in week two and that was against arizona he's usually pretty stout against uh fantasy tight ends doyle leads the team in receptions receiving yards first down catches of 20 plus yards tied for second in targets and he's played more snaps than any wide receiver on the team that includes T.Y. Hilton, Moncrief, Kamar Aiken, whoever you want, right? Played 92% of their snaps week one, 99% in week two. And it's good to see the, the connection between Jacoby Brissett and Jack Doyle, right, in the first game, because that's his first time starting for the Colts, and he's getting that connection. And Doyle's probably someone that he's going to be relying on. Now, Cleveland's actually favored in this game by a point, because I guess they're the home team, which can work both ways. You could say it's bad because, you know, Indy won't have as much garbage time to pad their, their passing stats. But it also means that the Colts are expected to be in this game, and right, maybe they're going to be moving the ball. Maybe they'll have more score opportunities so if things break well I like I think Doyle will see maybe one or two end zone targets and possibly he gets in this week along with 60 to 70 receiving yards also worth noting I went back last year when uh, Brissett was on New England and he got those two games where he was their quarterback and one of the two games was week four Martellus Bennett Bennett caught five passes for 109 yards with Brissett as quarterback so just figured I'd throw that stat in there and my fifth and final must start for week three Isaiah Crowell you're probably like how much Isaiah Crowell can this 
motherfucker throw down our throats until he's like, damn, Crowell just sucks, bro. I still don't believe that. So I'm going to keep pushing him. Going against the Colts, right? Piggybacking off Jack Doyle, right? Piggybacking into this game. The Browns week three matchup with Indy is going to be probably the friendliest game script Crowell and the Browns will get all season. Crowell's coming off a really bad game against the Ravens where he carried the ball just 10 times, right? And the Ravens have a great run D, so not surprised by that outcome. Supposedly Crowell went up to Hugh Jackson and he was like, yo, motherfucker, give me more carry. Let Bobby spin. Give me the raw. Nah, he just said, supposedly he's like, He's asking Hugh Jackson for more carries, and Hugh Jackson, well, over the last two seasons, what has Hugh Jackson said? That he wants to feed Crowell the ball, said he's going to do that, and this is the matchup to do that in this game. Crowell is still dominating this backfield in carries. He has 27 through two weeks. The next closest back is Duke Johnson with just four carries. So listen, Browns are one-point favorites. They're going to do what Hugh Jackson has been preaching for the last two years that he wants to do. They're going to carry the ball with Isaiah Crowell. He got 19 touches in week one, so this kind of debunks this stat, but I brought it up last week. There was four times in 2016 that Crowell had 19 touches or more, and in those four games, he averaged 127 total yards and scored four times in those four games. You know, behind this good offensive line, I expect Crowell to see 20 touches this game, and I expect him to finish as a top 12 fantasy running back for the week. So make sure you get Crowell in this lineup because you're not going to have as many good matchups as you'll find this week for him. We move on to my sell-high candidates. Last week, I talked about Todd Gurley and Leonard Fournette. This week, we'll talk about Todd Gurley again. There's nothing really I need to say about Todd Gurley other than everything I said last week. It's all the same reasons. He actually looked good for the first time in about six years in his week two game. But you know, he's had cake matchup so far. And the real season starts for Gurley as a fantasy owner in week five. Seattle. Then he's at Jacksonville, Arizona. At New York Giants. Houston. At Minnesota. Then he gets one easy matchup versus New Orleans. Then he's at Arizona. Philadelphia, then he's at Seattle, which is week, which is already week 15. It's the first playoff matchup for a lot of fantasy football league. So there's no break for Gurley here. He could do it against his cake matchups in the first couple weeks, but he's eventually going to falter. I'm telling you this, you need to sell him now. You don't want to wait for a dud game and then have Gurley's value kind of come back down to earth. As for Leonard Fournette, I mean, hopefully you kind of sold him last week if you could for like really top tier RB or wide receiver value. If you didn't, I would say he's probably fine moving forward with him as like a, an RB2. He's going to get the RB1 workload, but he won't get the RB1 type scoring opportunities. And Chris Ivory did get a surprisingly high number of touches in this game. He had nine. They were using him in short yard situation and a lot on third downs. He had three catches, which was weird. I don't know. I just, I'm just personally not as high on Fournette as a lot of people are, but I I, I might take him off the sell high list because I, I mentioned last week was the best week to sell him high because he had a ridiculous game and he's never going to have a high sell value like he had after week one. But I'll throw someone new in there and that's Jarvis Landry, the receiver, slot receiver out in Miami, right? Just not a guy I necessarily want on my team. And most people probably didn't draft him outside of full PPR leagues, or he doesn't have a lot of value outside of those leagues. He had his monster PPR day in week two, right? Their first game of the season. He caught 13 passes from, from Cutler. But they were going into Chargers, right? We look back at week one. They played the Broncos. Who is the Broncos slot receiver? Who operated as their slot receiver that game? Benny Fowler. Y'all know who Benny Fowler is? Probably not. I, probably, I didn't really even realize he did this. He scored two touchdowns from the slot in, in their first game. The Chargers excel on the outside. Right, they have Casey Hayward, Jason Verrett shadowing the top two corner, uh, the top two wide receivers. Verrett out last week, going to be out for the foreseeable future. But I think it just opens up a lot of lanes over the middle, a lot of targets for the slot receivers, which is what you saw with Jarvis Landry. And you just look historically at Cutler. He just doesn't use his slot wide receivers. I was looking back like the best slot receiver season for a Jay Cutler quarterback team over the last like five or six years was Earl Bennett back in 2012 when he caught 29 passes, 375 yards, two touchdowns in 12 games. Cutler just loves using the outside weapons. He loves using his tight ends, right? He used Brandon Marshall and Alshon Jeffrey like to perfection. He was always chucking them the ball. And I think we're going to see that eventually translate into a Devontae Parker, Kenny Stills type connection. So I can't imagine Landry's value being much higher than it is right now after a 13 catch game in PPR leagues. I will say his next his schedule over the next few weeks is really 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 easy. He gets the Jets, the Saints, the Titans, he's at Atlanta, and then he gets the Jets again. So it might be worth even waiting a few more weeks and hoping that, you know, he balls out for at least like one or two of these next few games. But that's on you if you want to do that. I, I think right now would probably be a pretty good value to try to get him off your team. I just don't think Cutler is really going to use Landry like the Dolphins have over the last few years. Those are my sell high guys, Gurley and Landry again. We'll move to my buy low. 
Buy low slash relax candidates, meaning hold on, they'll be fine. I shouldn't even have to say these first three, but I'll do it anyways because I'm getting a lot of questions about them. Should I be concerned? Should I trade them? Le'Veon Bell, Michael Thomas, AJ Green, stop. Keeping them, you're starting them, nothing. Shh. I might switch that poster. I might not switch it. I like that poster, but I might get a poster where it's like the shh symbol. So every time like something stupid like this comes up, someone asks me if they should trade Le'Veon Bell. I'm just going to send a picture of someone doing this. These are all guys going back to my trade target video that I made weeks ago about the top trade targets for week one through four. Joe Mixon, Isaiah Crowell, and then Marcus Mariota, along with the Tennessee weapons, are all still on that list for me. I still love them as buy low candidates right now. Mixon hasn't done anything over the first few weeks, but this new offensive coordinator coming in, like I said, I think he's going to try to spark something in the offense, and I think that might come by way of getting Mixon more touches. So now is the time to buy Mixon. I expect by week like five or six, we're going to start seeing him get 15 plus touches. Mariota, Corey Davis, Rashard Matthews, tough three game stretch for the passing offense starting in week two. Then they get Seattle, and then they get Houston, uh, but they should be back on track weeks five through seven, Miami, Indy, Cleveland. You have Eric Decker struggling. He's not really getting any production going. Rashard Matthews is looking like the clear-cut wide receiver two in this offense, regardless of who's on, you know, wide receiver one, who's slot receiver. So he's like the most consistent. Corey Davis now dealing with this hamstring injury. His value only shoots down further. Rashard Matthews, if, if he misses time, Matthews is more valuable. So they're going to struggle for the next couple weeks, but I think when week five kind of rolls around, this offense will pick things back up. And these are guys you could buy probably very, very low on a dollar right now and just hold on to them if you have them. And lastly, we have Kelvin Benjamin. Again, I, I had him on my must starts for this week, so that's kind of obvious. Leads the team in targets. Cam is coming into his own finally. Olsen is injured, so he should get plenty of targets. They get good matchup against the Saints and then the, the, the Patriots over the next two weeks, so I like Ben to bounce back pretty big. I'm gonna go out on a limb and also say Eric Decker in that Tennessee receiving corpse. I'm not holding him. I'm not like relaxed about him, but I'd say give him one more game. If he doesn't have like a six for 80 and a touchdown performance, Definitely cut ties with him. Russell Wilson. Here's what I want to say. I know the O-line is bad. This offense looks bad. 12 points against the Niners. But I saw a great stat on uh, on Twitter. I think it was from Graham Barfield. Definitely go follow him on Twitter. Russell Wilson has finished as a top six fantasy passer in 30.5% of his career games, all of which have come in weeks three to 16. Isn't that crazy? So he always starts off really slow. So Wilson, I'm not panicking yet. Keep Wilson, keep Wilson in the lineup. I'm move forward to my cut him. You can get Paul Perkins out of there. Just awful. No offensive line. Orleans Darkwash should eventually start getting more work. You can cut Jeremy Hill. You can cut Latavius Murray. You can cut Eddie Lacy, CJ Prosa. You can pretty much cut the entire Seattle backfield besides Carson. I will say, if you have room to keep Thomas Rawls, and if you're a uh, Chris Carson owner, I would definitely think about keeping him. Only because I want to see what the, uh, the backfield touch situation looks like once Thomas Rawls is healthy, right? And they're using him to his fullest, which might not be that much. You know, Chris Carson has looked really good. So um, I would, I'm would, i fine dropping CJ Proceis, though. Um, and if you need to drop Rawls, I'm okay with that. Same thing with Andrew Luck. If you need to drop Luck, I'm okay with that. We have no idea when he's going to be returning. So if you need the roster spot, go for it. You can also drop any Baltimore wide receiver not named Jeremy Macklin. He leads the team with nine targets, 87 yards, two touchdowns. Mike Wallace and Brashad Perriman have combined for 11 targets. They've turned those 11 targets into 20 receiving yards. Not too shabby. Cut ties with them Baltimore boys. And Brandon Marshall. He might be someone that a lot of you guys want to wait on for one more week. But listen, it's clear to me that the G-Man are barely going to be able to support one fantasy wide receiver, and that's Odell Beckham. So behind him, I mean, it's possible that, you know, Ingram, Marshall, Shepard, like switch games where they're all useful on and off, but there's no way Marshall's giving you consistent wide receiver two or even wide receiver three numbers going forward. So I'm fine dropping Marshall. Lastly, is John Brown. Like I said, he's almost definitely missing week three, and I would bet that he misses more than that. Maybe not, maybe not week four, but I think at some point again throughout the season, he's going to miss more games. So I could drop week I could drop John Brown, no problem. Here's a new section. Here's a new segment that I didn't put in last week, but five storylines that I'm most most looking forward to in week three. This is fantasy, this is NFL, this is just, you know, what I'll be keeping a close eye on. That is one I've talked about already multiple times. Bengals and having Bill Lazier coming in as a new offensive coordinator. Does Mixon get an uptick in snaps and touches? Is AJ Green featured there? Do they do they feed him targets? Does Dalton look any better under a new kind of scheme? Is John Ross utilized at all? So I'll be keeping an eye on that. 
Number two, the 2 0 Detroit Lions. Are they any good? Are they actually legit? Can I trust them? You know, they've looked really good against Arizona and the Giants over the first two weeks. But, you know, at the end of the season, we might look back and be like, okay, well, the Giants and the Cardinals combined for like 13 wins. So it's hard to tell if Detroit's actually legit right now. They'll have their first real test in week three when they face the Falcons. Now, I would say on a, on a side note, listen, like anything that happened in the first few weeks is probably not a good basis on how to judge a team or a player. I would say like usually I don't gamble on games and if I do, well I do gamble on games but I don't do it early in the year because you have no idea what a team really is until probably five or six weeks into the season. Like they they had maybe good matchups, bad matchups, getting personnel in the right places, getting coaching schemes down, things like that. There's a lot of moving parts in the beginning of the season so you can't really get a good feel for for teams and that goes for players. So for the most part, you should be cautious when either gambling or like releasing players that you are high on. Third thing I'm looking forward to is just Odell Beckham. What is his fantasy outlook moving forward for this season? He might get force fed targets because his offense is so bad or the fact that, you know, Eli just has no blocking on the offensive line. Is that going to be a huge problem for Odell Beckham? moving forward, right? He played in 34 snaps, which was 61% of their offensive plays in week two. So that's a good sign going forward. There's no setback or anything like that. We had Shepard played 100% of their snaps, Brandon Marshall played 86% of their snaps in week two. So OBJ will get more involved as the weeks go by, but 61 is a good starting point. We'll see if the production follows suit there. Number four, straight up, just Tennessee versus Seattle. The backfield situations for both teams, plain and simple. Numero five, storyline I'm looking forward to, Washington offense versus the Raiders. They haven't lived up to what a lot of people thought they were going to be, right? A lot of people are high on Pryor. A lot of people are high on Crowder. They were high on Cousins overall. Just this passing offense. But this is a good of a good a week as any to turn shit around. They are playing Sunday night football. They are playing against Oakland, who has a bad pass defense, at home with an over-under of 50 so if they don't get it done here, I'm going to be pretty nervous about my uh, my stock in Washington, even though I don't own any prior and I don't think I even own any cousins, but for I'm sure a lot of y'all do. This is a big matchup in uh, telling, you know, the outlook going forward. Streaming defenses. How we doing? We picked three last week. My number one was Baltimore. That was easy as hell. They were going against the Browns. They scored like 17 fantasy points. Then I picked Cincy and Baltimore. I mean, Cincy and Jacksonville. Jacksonville, I said in my write-up, I was like, I'm skeptical about this. I would not probably be starting them personally, but they looked so good in week one, and then things finally came back down to earth week two. They got slapped by the Titans, 37 points allowed. That's what happens when you have Blake Bortles. You know, they don't sustain drives. They, they have a lot of turnovers, giving the other team a lot of good field position and that you know that's the thing right if you're a good defense you can be as good as you want but if your offense isn't moving the ball the other team is always going to have good field position since he was okay i think they put up like seven fantasy points one one and one right there i have two streamers this week number one easily i picked them up in like two or three of my leagues it's philly versus the giants they're at home philadelphia they're only 46 percent owned and this is after the waiver wire processed on wednesday already so they're still very likely uh available in a lot of your leagues now the giants allowed 12 fantasy points to Dallas defense in week one, 17 to Detroit on Monday night. They have an awful offensive line, the Giants, right? They've allowed eight sacks through the first two weeks. Eli has thrown an interception each of the first two games. And the matchup is so well because Philly's front seven is the strong point of this defense. And the Giants, obviously, their front five is the weak point of this offense. While the G-Men have allowed eight sacks, Philly also has eight sacks through the first two games, right? The, the Eagles are a mismatch for the Giants. And I, I look to I see that playing itself out, and I see that kind of being a massacre on that side of the ball for the Giants in week three. They're six-point favorites. They're at home. They have an over-under on the lower side. It's like 42 or 42 and a half. I'm good with Philly as my starting defense. They're always an underrated defense at fantasy for some reason. I mean, they score a lot, but they don't score any more than the top defenses, so they don't only rely on that, which is hit and miss. They were top five defense in fantasy in 2016, and I expect them to be going forward as well. The next one, Miami at Jets. They're only 26% owned in Yahoo. I mean, I don't usually love picking road defenses as streamers, but Miami's six-point favorite over under 42, and listen, simply they're playing against the Jets. Miami's going to look to ground and pound with Jay Ajayi. He's going to get like 25-plus carries in this game. That's going to eat up a ton of their clock. They're going to dominate time of possession. So I would be shocked if the Jets put up anything more than like 11 points on offense. Now, the Dolphins' D isn't particularly good, but like they're playing the Jets. So those are like my top two. But, you know, if Sam Bradford doesn't play for some reason, Tampa Bay becomes a great option on defense. 
defense. And I honestly wouldn't hate either Cleveland or Indianapolis. They're playing against each other, so I wouldn't hate either of those teams in this matchup as a defense. That's if you're really desperate. I'm not like dropping a, a top 10 defense and streaming into your Cleveland, but if you're in like a really deep league and you have a terrible matchup with an okay defense, I wouldn't hate picking up Cleveland or something. And we keep on trucking through to my hashtag locks of the century. For y'all gambling folks, I pick three games every week, whether it's over under, whether it's money line, whether it's point spread, and I give them to you. As far as I'm concerned, any win percentage over 51% is a dub. That's how Vegas wins. That's how I win. Last week, we looked back. In week one, we were two and one. Last week, we took Jets at Oakland over 43 and a half. We hit that one. That's a dub. We had the Chargers minus four versus Miami. We'll hold the L there. And then I had Mini at Pittsburgh. I had the over 45 and a half. I'm going to count that as a draw because I filmed the video Wednesday night and that was before Bradford was ruled out. So we're going to take that as a draw three and two on the season. I have three for this week. We got the Rams at San Fran over 39 and a half. Then we have Philly minus six at home versus the Giants. I already told you, I think it's going to be a huge mismatch for that Philly front seven versus the Giants O-line. So I like Philly to dominate that game. Lastly, we have Dallas at Arizona. I like over 46 and a half. I don't think either of these defenses are particularly great. I think Dallas has a bounce back. Zeke's hearing all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're giving up on your team. I think he's fired up. I think he's ready to roll. And I think these offenses get back on track. I think Palmer's not as bad as people say he is. I like him to link up with JJ Nelson on a couple deep shots. So I like the over 46 and a half on that game. And as always, I get into my league recaps, my fantasy football league recaps. Another two and two week for me on the season. I got a dub in my E-Town Get Down League, which is, that's the only thing that matters to me. I can go one and three and get a dub in the E-Town Get Down League and I'll be happy. But if I go three and one, and my loss is the E-Town get down. I don't want it. I'm pissed. I'm depressed. And schedule a doctor's appointment, basically. So we went 2-2. Two two. I got a win in my subscriber league, which I should be 2-0 and on if I took OBJ out of my flex and we won like an idiot. I lost in the Fantasy Jocks League, and I lost in my league against against my college friends. My friend just put up a big week. He had like 140 points. My E-Town get down league, I put up like 150, and I almost lost. Took down the defending champ, the Don. Don World Order, I needed to fucking show him. I'm like the Kingslayer. I put um, a picture of uh, of Jamie Lannister in our in our fantasy group chat. Let him know the Kingslayer's here. Had to take him down, but his team is pretty stacked. So that was a huge win for me. I need to get off the 0-1 schneid there. So I'm looking forward to next week. And I think that wraps it up for the week three games or the week three video outlook. Guys, as always, if this helped you, if you uh, like the video, if whatever, if I've helped you so far this year, this preseason, just scroll down, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be having these videos every single Thursday throughout the season, as well as my waiver wire sheet on Tuesday. The podcast with Fantasy Football that I film on Thursday night, they release it on their channel, I think, Friday. I won't be around for this one because I got a wedding on Friday and the wedding rehearsal. I'm in the wedding, so I have a wedding rehearsal Thursday night, so I can't do the podcast with them. And then on Sunday, we do, I'm doing the Fantasy Football Live. So if you need any sit-start questions, just make sure you got your notifications on for my YouTube channel. You can come into the live stream, ask your question, I'll answer it, and you can leave if you want, but it's a lot of fun, so maybe you could stay. And I commented on my last video who won the, the hat giveaway, but I still like to hear who took the biggest L's of the week or the biggest dubs. It doesn't even have to be fantasy football related. If you took any <laughs> big L's over last weekend, I want to hear about it. Can be losing by 0.2 because someone kneeled. Could be not closing the deal because you got whiskey. De I'm just kidding, but not really. Let me know whatever L's you took over the weekend, boys. And y'all will see my pretty face on Sunday morning. Peace out.